Sometimes life is full of cliches. Yes, cliches exist for a reason because they are common occurrences or sayings. Well, my life has recently turned into a cliche when it comes to my wife of 10 years. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Martin Baxter, and I run my own salsa-making business here in Santa Barbara, California. I have every type of Mexican, Central, and South American pepper known to man at my disposal. I even recently started making habanero salsa. People like it, but in very small doses. It also seems to be very popular in colleges as part of hazing. Some of my best buyers of really cool stuff are college fraternities. Go figure. I've always loved spicy food, so it was natural that I got into this business. As for how my wife fits into some of life's cliches, Cindy has become distant lately. Yeah, I know, at least now I know. And that's another cliche. When we got married 10 years ago, we were both madly in love with each other. I had just been discharged from the army and was opening my first salsa store. I had saved very little of my own money, and while I was home, I signed up for some online cooking classes. That kept me sane in Afghanistan for that first year, and then I got out and was ready to get into some business. Back then, before the economic downturn caused by the widespread bursting of the housing market bubble, it wasn't hard to get a loan. But even today, my Baxter's Burner Salsa business is still thriving. The problem, however, was not my business, as you probably could have guessed by now. No, the problem was my wife and the fact that she was cheating on me. The way I found out about it was a big cliche. Well, not really. The most common cliche is coming home early and catching them in bed together. No, the second big cliche is leaving, forgetting something, then coming back and overhearing a conversation about them getting together while I was busy at work and our son was at school. Yes, we have a child together, Brian Baxter, named after Cindy's father. Oh, and before you ask, yes, he's mine. I know he's mine because he was conceived on our honeymoon and we were together every moment of every day alone together on her father's yacht. Also, I had him DNA tested after I found out about her and the asshole she slept with on the side. The way it all happened was another cliche. I forgot my laptop, which had my finished formula for the new salsa fallen on it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Not too original, but the fact that it was the purest habanero you could get in pasta form was something. Of course, we added other elements to it as we went along, but I was going to put the first batch together the same day. I needed that laptop, and I went back as quietly and quickly as I could to get it. As I entered my den, I heard her walking down the hallway and talking on the phone. Of course, I could only hear half of her conversation. Hey, sexy. Yeah, that idiot went to work. Asterisk. Yeah, don't worry. Tonight you're gonna get something he's never had before. Mmm, you guessed it. I want you to set me on fire, baby. Oh, hell yeah. My world collapsed. I numbly gathered up my laptop and headed back to my car. Hell, I don't even remember driving to the store. When I got there, Becky was behind the counter and Sari was sitting with a customer, giving him a taste of the latest batch of our medium spicy salsa that put pace to shame. I managed to fake a smile as I pondered what I should do now. Divorce, of course. Cindy's father didn't trust me back then when I first met his daughter and married her, so I had to sign a prenup. The prenup stated that in the event of marital betrayal, the offending party would leave the marriage with nothing in the event of a divorce. This was not a one-way street, as I would not have signed it if it had been. Then all these boilerplate questions popped into my head. How long had she been having fun with him? Why was she sleeping with him in the first place? Was I not good enough for her? Why is she disrespecting me over him? If she is so unhappy, why hasn't she divorced me yet? How am I going to prove her infidelity? That's when it hit me. The most insidious plan I had ever thought of, and after reflecting on what I had planned, I realized I felt no guilt. I went over all the pluses I had. 18 centimeters, dignity, and I knew how to use it. I'd lived in the world long enough to know the difference between a fake finish and a real one. And Cindy hadn't faked a single time in the 10 years we'd been married. It couldn't have been about sex. Could it be? Hell, for God's sake, I'd memorized the fucking Kama Sutra by heart. I was still in good shape, working out three times a week and running five days a week. Yes, 
I was still sticking to my own physical therapy regimen from my time in the hospital. But the plan itself, on further reflection, was probably the most insidious revenge plan anyone had ever devised. You see, hot chili peppers such as habanero affect the mucous membranes in the mouth. However, have you ever eaten something really spicy and then sat on the toilet the next day and yelled, give me a poppy, while you were doing the needy? Yeah, I was getting really sadistic when I thought about how I was going to get my revenge. The vaginal or rectal heat of 450,000 Scoville units was going to provide a very fun time, at least for me. Now I just needed a delivery system. I prepared a small batch in record time and offered the girls a taste. They each had to fan their mouths and eat a lot of bread to put out the fire. Both then gave enthusiastic thumbs up for my efforts. However, I still needed a delivery system. The day flew by quickly, and although I always enjoyed socializing with the young ladies I hired, I headed home early. I stopped by my attorney's office and asked him to draw up the divorce papers, citing infidelity as the reason. I told him that I would have some proof in a day or two. He resisted at first, but when I told him about the conversation I had heard that morning, he was sympathetic and nodded in agreement. I then left his office and drove home. As I turned onto my street, I saw a small red sporty Mercedes coupe pull out of my driveway and head in my direction. The man behind the wheel was blonde-haired, blue-eyed, with a smug smirk on his face. The face of this asshole? I recognized him as the guy from one of Cindy's social gatherings we went to. He was always asking her to dance, and she always agreed to those dances. Now I knew why. My anger rose again, and I was more than ready to put my plan into action. The hardest part was acting normal when I got home. I wasn't about to reveal my cards to this bitch before I could play. I took a deep breath, then stepped inside. I put my best loving husband smile on my face. Hi, honey. Cindy greeted me with enthusiasm. She had obviously just showered as her hair was still very damp. Her long blonde curls spread across her shoulders, and I was once again mesmerized by her beauty. But physical beauty is one thing. Inner ugliness trumps that. After the conversation she'd had with asshole that morning, her outer beauty no longer had the same effect on me as it used to. Hey, sexy lady, taking a shower this time of day? I asked playfully, touching her hair. Yeah, I got a good workout in earlier. She smiled and kissed me. Yes, holding a parry, you did. Well, your training tomorrow will be much more interesting, I thought to myself. She said dinner would be ready in an hour, so I kissed her again and headed down the hall to our bedroom. The smell of the room freshener really drowned out the smell of sex, but at least they had changed the sheets on the bed. I almost went without dinner when I thought about getting in that bed with her tonight. I would burn it at the first opportunity. And then a thought struck me. They must have used some kind of lubricant for sex. Hmm. I rummaged through her nightstand, and sure enough, there was a tube of the cherry jelly we sometimes used. Son of a bitch. I opened the lid, and it was almost the same shade of red as the salsa I'd made with a white-hot flame inside. I grinned as I completely removed the cap from the cream, squeezed some into the toilet, flushed, then poured some paste from the little bottle of salsa into the tube. I put the cap back on and squeezed it, stirring inside the tube itself. Then I took the cap off again and put more salsa in it, then repeated the process. Once I thought it was mixed enough, I took the cap off and squeezed out a little bit. I smelled it, and sure enough, it was delicious. I washed my finger and put the cap back on, then put it in her bedside table exactly as I found it. I was now in a much better mood and took a nice, long, hot shower. Then I went out for dinner. I was wearing blue jeans, a t-shirt, and a smile on my face. God, it smelled so good. I sat down at the table with enthusiasm. I opened a bottle of beer, and we all started on her lasagna. God, I'm going to miss her cooking, probably even more than I was going to miss having sex with her. Brian came home and sat in his seat between Cindy and me. We talked about his day at school, and Cindy advised him to do his homework. Yes, she is a very good mom to him, too. Cindy sexually was always a quick study, very experienced and full of enthusiasm. So yes, I loved having sex with her, 
Whether it was sex or lovemaking, it was always special. For a few moments, I pondered the implications of what I was about to do. Petty revenge on my cheating wife and her asshole lover. Then a divorce that would leave her with nothing from our life together. She could sue for custody of Brian, and maybe even win. I love my son, and I really didn't want him to be abused by her after our divorce. I had already planned for that, too. I had indicated in the divorce papers that I wanted full custody of my son and that I would allow her frequent visits, but only under my supervision. I didn't want him to become dependent on her jerk lover who might just try to take my place as Brian's father. The pain in my heart didn't leave me that night, and I soon excused myself, saying I needed to get some sleep. I told Cindy that I wasn't feeling well and that I had tasted some really spicy salsa at work, so she smiled sympathetically and wished me a good night. I went into my den first and grabbed my old mini video camera and mini tape recorder. The last time I used a camcorder was during our last anniversary vacation when we went to Disney World. And the last time I used a tape recorder was when I was just starting out to record my thoughts before buying a laptop. Then I went into our bedroom with it and put the video camera behind some DVDs under our TV so that it would have a good view of the bed. I made sure the little green light bulb was taped up with duct tape so it wouldn't give out when I turned it on in the morning. However, the battery was fully charged. Good. A whole eight hours of footage, considering I started it right before I left in the morning. I hid the recorder under the bed, but didn't start recording yet. The small memory card in the recorder also allows for eight hours of recording. The battery was also fully charged. I smirked. It was obvious the asshole had been here all day, and they had finished just in time for them both to shower and him to leave. If I hadn't turned onto my street a little earlier, I might never have seen him. The only possible problem with my plan was that they might not do anything the next day. Well, if they didn't, then I would keep at it until I caught them in the act. I then used my cell phone to call Becky. I told her I was going to take a few days vacation, but if Cindy called, to tell her I was in a meeting with a client. I then explained the situation, but only that I was trying to catch them red-handed, and she said, No problem, boss. Becky is a good person, and she knows I would never cheat on Cindy. She's also stunningly of Puerto Rican descent. She's been working at the store for five years now and knows a thing or two about running a business. The dream that night went on for a long time. I kept thinking about what might happen in the morning or what might happen in a few days. From the way she was talking to him, they had been sleeping together for some time. I've already figured out what to do this morning, and every morning after that, if it comes to that. After I turn on the camera and recorder, I'll slip out of the house, circle the alley behind our house, and drive through the gate in the alley right under our bedroom window. From this vantage point, I could hear everything that was going on. I sneaked a cooler outside with snacks, beer, and soda one of those wonderful coolers that will keep you cold for days as long as the battery is charged. I finally fell asleep, praying that something would happen sooner rather than later. I woke up the next morning and dressed as usual. I waited for Cindy to shower, then turned on my camera and recorder and left the house as usual. It didn't take me long to walk around the back of the house and slip inside through the gate in the alley. I left my car there as I hoped to be there for a very short time. After Cindy sent Brian off to school, she was on the phone again. She had invited him back to her place again, and from her confirmation, it looked like he would be there in 20 minutes. I smirked. I made sure I wasn't seen through the window by the asshole, my cheating whore, or the camera, which had an amazing view of the room. I stopped by the nearest drugstore around the corner from our house and bought a new tube of the cherry jelly that Cindy favored. It was a flash of inspiration to cover my tracks, just in case. I got home ten minutes later, and fifteen minutes later I was sitting under my bedroom window with five minutes to spare. I then sat under the window, opened the refrigerator, and pulled out a ham and Swiss cheese sandwich and a cold ale from the mini brewery. I was slowly sipping it between bites of my sandwich, savoring the rich flavor, when I heard Mudok's Mercedes pull up in the driveway. Apparently they didn't care if the neighbors saw it. I figured it would be a shame if something bad happened to Mudok's ride. So as soon as I heard the front door open and close, I slipped around the corner of the house and then out the side gate. I had my penknife with me and decided to carve Mudak on his door. 
Oh, my revenge could get me thrown in jail, but I was going to have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. I jerked on the handle of his door, and oh wonder, the arrogant jerk had left it unlocked. Well, we lived in a nice neighborhood and nothing bad happened during the day. I checked his glove compartment and found his registration card and insurance. John Lawson. Now Asshole had a name, but I was going to keep calling him Asshole. It was easier to remember. I took his registration card and insurance and put them in my pocket. Then I decided it would be a lot of fun to trim his valve stems a little, so I sawed them in half. I heard the screaming starting and called Paul, my attorney, and told him the game was up. I let him know that the evidence would be ready in a couple of hours at the most, and to get the lawsuit ready and put Mr. John Lawson's name on the divorce papers. Then I slipped back into the backyard and heard through the window as they screamed in pain from the hottest salsa on earth, which, figuratively speaking, made their asses catch fire. I sat down under the window and sipped some more ale. I let a snide grin distort my face and had to suppress a laugh as they tried to figure out what was going on. Oh, God, why is it burning? God damn it hurts. Finally, I stood up and decided to go inside. Oh, shit, I think I forgot my laptop again. I went and pulled my car back into the driveway, then went inside and found the asshole and the whore squirming in agony as they tried like crazy to get in the shower and douse themselves with cold water to put out the fire. As I approached the bathroom door, I gathered all my anger together. What the hell is going on in here? I roared. This picture was priceless. I experienced some very deep satisfaction at this turn of events. Then I looked at my wife, whose ass and body were crimson red from the irritation and intense burning caused by the 450 000, 000, 000 spice pepper jelly. Oh my God, Marty, she screamed and then shrieked in pain. Please, Marty, I'm so sorry. She shrieked again and Mudok begged not to be hurt as well. I kept a memorized mask of anger and disbelief on my face. I stepped forward and delivered a hell of a punch to Mudok's jaw, knocking him back against the shower stall wall. I then delivered several brutal blows to his balls, effectively destroying them. At this point, I pulled out my cell phone and called 911. While Mudok was unconscious and slut Cindy was crying and screaming at the top of her voice, literally, I grabbed the fake tube of cream and replaced it with a new one, breaking the seal and removing a few swabs from it. I then went to my car and threw the fake tube under the back seat. I would throw it later in a dumpster behind a gas station or something. I told the 911 operator that I came home to get my laptop for work and caught my wife in the shower with her lover. I told her that something seemed to be very wrong with both of them and that their organs were swollen and red. She sent the police an ambulance to my address. I thanked her and hung up. Now, our neighbor across the street, Mrs. Kendall, was a real nerd and the queen of local gossip. I knew she knew about Mudak's daily visits, so when the EMTs and cops arrived, I crossed the street to talk to her. Oh, hey, Marty, she said with a smile as she opened her door. Hello, Mrs. Kendall. Have you by any chance seen that little red Mercedes outside my house before? I asked with a smile. Why not, in fact, for the past few months? Every day from Monday through Friday. She smiled, and her seeming innocence belied the fact that she had actually known about it for so long. Thank you, Mrs. Kendall. Mm. Did you see anything strange this morning other than a red Mercedes pulling up? I asked. Nothing, dear, she said. So she did not see me messing with his car. I saw you leave, and then Brian headed toward the bus stop. Then he got there about 20 minutes after Brian left. Then I went to watch my morning shows, and when I came back, you were just pulling up to the house. Thank you, Mrs. Kendall. Do you mind if the police take a statement from you? I asked. Oh, not at all, dear. I'll do anything I can to help, said the little old lady, who knew more about other people's affairs than they did. Thank you very much, ma'am. I smiled and hugged her then walked back to my side of the street to the waiting cops. I called Becky and asked if she would tell her that I had been there this morning but forgot my laptop. She asked why, and I told her a brief version of what had happened. She laughed her ass off and promised to be my alibi.
She said she would invite Sari to get involved, too. I thanked her, then went and talked to the detective who had just shown up. Are you Mr. Baxter? He asked. Yes, sir. I nodded. He proceeded to question me about my whereabouts, and I told him that I went to work at my salsa store but forgot my laptop. When I returned, I heard screaming and found my wife and her lover in the shower screaming for some unknown reason. I admitted that I lost my temper and attacked the man who was trespassing on my property, and the detective said he would worry about it later. The female ER doctor finally managed to cool Cindy's body enough with aloe cream to make her coherent enough to ask questions. She walked over, grabbed the tube of cream off the bedside table, and handed it to the detective who bagged it as an exhibit. I told the detective that my wife and I sometimes used it for extra sensation during lovemaking, which was true, or had been before. So my fingerprints on it wouldn't arouse suspicion. The other thing was the car, but since Mrs. Kendall had been watching me since I'd returned in my car after ruining Mudok's ride, she was more than willing to sign a written statement as my alibi. I always liked that old boar. I swore I didn't know who wrote all that stuff on his door, but I promised to shake that guy's hand if I ever met him. He did me a favor. When Cindy and Mudak were moved to the hospital for observation and some tests, I went in there and gathered my evidence. I pulled out a video camera from behind the DVDs, then pulled out a tape recorder from under the bed. I stopped both recordings and went to my den to load the memory cards onto my laptop. I cut the videos after I came in and caught them, so the way I replaced the tube of cream wasn't there. I also cut the same amount of time out of the voice recording. Detective Crawford entered my office as I was finishing up my creative deletions. He told me that even if I messed up this man's car, he would make sure that no charges would be filed. He also wouldn't say anything in his report about this asshole's destroyed testicles. I asked why. Let's just say you're not the only man whose wife is a cheating whore. My ex did the same thing to me. Point in favor of us shitting husbands. He shook my hand, and I showed him the videotape I'd recorded from the bedroom. He laughed uproariously with me when they started screaming in the middle of sex. After we wiped the tears of laughter from our eyes, and he told me they would tow this asshole's car at the owner's expense, he shook my hand again and left, still laughing at the farcical cop comedy where two people fall on top of each other trying to get into the shower and into the bathroom with cold water. But at least part of my why question was answered. She wanted something more, and it was just starting to cost her. I called Paul and asked him to send the processing servers to the Santa Barbara hospital where Cindy and Mudok were taken. I then emailed him proof of the affair and told him to get a copy of Mrs. Kendall's statement to the police. He told me he would, and I leaned back in my chair. I began to wait for Brian to come home. Now the real moral quandary. What do I tell my nine-year-old son about why his mom is in the hospital? I sighed and came up with a plan that wouldn't denigrate her too much. I decided to tell him that mom had a problem with wanting other men besides me, and it wasn't good. I would get that into my son's head so he wouldn't end up thinking it was okay for women to not sleep with their husbands. Then I remembered overhearing their conversation the previous morning and started laughing again. It just occurred to me that she had given me an idea on how to carry out my revenge. I want you to set my ass on fire with that big stick, baby. Yes, those were her words. Well, her wish came true. An hour passed when I got a call on my cell phone from the hospital. Hello, I said. Marty, that would be my loving wife, a.k.a. Cindy the Whore. Her voice sounded angry. Oh, hello, I said. I guess the process servers found you and your ass. Oh, and the asshole too, I smirked. Fuck you, I don't know what you did to me, but I swear to God I'm going to press charges against your little asshole. She screamed. What the hell are you talking about, whore? I yelled back, going on the offensive. I came home to get my laptop and found you in the shower with some asshole who obviously had you. I don't know what the hell you think I might have done, but I only found out about it this morning. Oh, and since when did my boyfriend become a little boy? Did you just get used to Mr. Big? That's what happens to king-sized whores. The prenup is in effect, bitch. Don't come home. Brian will live with me and you won't get shit in the divorce after my testimony is admitted in court. You're lucky I'll let you visit your son, but I will not let you make him think a cheating bitch wife is okay. That knocked the wind out of her sails. 
You, you wouldn't. You wouldn't tell him what I did, would you? Damn right I will. Why wouldn't you? He deserves to know what the hell kind of mother he has. I yelled at her some more. Bloody whore. Shall I go on? How many were there? Is Brian even my son? If not, you tell me who the father is and I'll sue him for back child support for raising his bastard. No, Brian is your son, she said in a low voice. Well, you'll pardon me if I run a DNA test on that, I said, not bothering to hide my anger. Then she started crying for real and each sob was music to my ears. Wow, I was turning into a real bastard. But then I had a reason, just because. I wasn't going to be a laughing stock anymore. That honor would go to Mr. John Lawson, or was it now Mr. John Freaky Wonder Lawson? Whichever it was, he was still an asshole. When Brian got home, I softened up a bit and gave him only the bare minimum of information he needed. I turned it into a visual lesson in infidelity by telling him that bad things happen to cheaters. Eventually, Mom would be okay, but she would no longer live with us. He hugged me and told me he loved us both, but didn't want to live with a grown man. I smiled involuntarily at his mispronunciation. Well, there's not much more to tell except that the divorce went off without a hitch. I talked to Cindy's dad about what had happened and told him what I had done. He laughed so hard I thought the old man was going to have a heart attack. Cindy eventually made a full recovery, but she never ate salsa again to my knowledge. John Asshole Lawson eventually had both of his damaged testicles removed. The official police report said it was an accident because he slipped in the shower and hit a bar of soap. I smirked at that. Good old Detective Crawford. A good man, that one. Last I heard, the asshole had left town for parts unknown. Well, that's what he deserves for screwing another man's wife. When I finally got the truth from Cindy about what had happened that started the affair, she admitted that he had approached her at one of her social events while I was out of town negotiating a contract. She had too much wine, and once she felt it in her, she realized she wanted him all the time. She said she still loved me and that it was just sex. And I bet you thought you were done with the cliché. No way, she begged me to take her back. She said she would never lose her way again. I told her to back off, and so on and so forth. Becky and I started dating, and she assured me that she was not a size queen, especially after we slept together the first time. We're getting married in a month, and our baby will be born next spring. Brian is excited about having a little brother or sister. The last time I talked to Cindy after her visit with Brian, we got to talking. I never should have cheated on you, Marty, she said with a resigned sigh. Why not? I was an idiot, and it set your ass on fire. I smirked, and the shock on her face made me rejoice. Life is full of cliches, but sometimes life is pretty damn good, too.